painting pieces that are fun for the artist and the observer, racing across the finish line to claim the ultimate title. And how about finishing off your day with a no-bake brownie? Art, sports, culture, and food. It's all local and it's all on this episode of Go See to Sky. Welcome to Go See to Sky. I'm your host, Heather Butts, at the base of Whistler Mountain. Get ready for it. In just a few short days, more than 400 athletes from around the world will come to Whistler Village racing in the Whistler Cup. They'll be on many courses on Whistler and Blackcomb Mountain racing for the ultimate title during the 22nd annual Whistler Cup. We'll have more information for you on this big event as our show continues. But first, we're heading down to Squamish, where a local artist is painting nothing but local animals. Candace Keith used to paint landscapes with tiny brush strokes, but now she's found a new passion in painting the animals that surround her. You just kind of get in the zone. I find it just, I, I don't know, it's, it's a place of comfort for me. Stroking the bird's chest with her brush, Candace Keith adds tone and texture, bringing her feathered friend to life. My paintings are very whimsical and lighthearted, and it, and it really almost puts you in a better mood. It gets you laughing and, and um, puts you in a better spirit. Simply put, Keith's paintings are fun. That is what they're meant to be for both the observer and the artist. The Squamish creator spent more than 10 years painting landscapes with fine block techniques using tiny brushes. But in 2013, she began painting animal portraits. That is when the style of her paintings and the way she composes them changed. My best paintings are usually when I get some really new good music. It'll have like Eminem blaring and when I'm literally dancing at the same time as painting is when I do my best. Wild and free, just like the animals she paints. Her new technique, big brushes and a relaxed dance far from her easel allow for a fun, loose approach, adding energy to her paintings and her passion. Painting is everything. It's my, it's pretty much next to my family and kids, it's my life. By painting, it makes me better at doing the rest of my world. It, it puts me in a better place. It brings me balance. From bright-eyed birds to playful cows, Keith's animals are lively and fun. Each with their own personality, it's as though they're about to say hello. Her talent comes from within, but her inspiration is found in the outdoors. I have three young children. And so sitting by the window doesn't actually happen very often. It's more of washing the dishes and seeing the birds or observing my surroundings. Whether she's staring at the birds through her kitchen window or wandering the trails along farm fields by her home, local animals are what inspire her. And those are the only animals she paints. I've tried painting red cardinals. And then I, I painted my second one. And then I discovered that they weren't local. I couldn't paint another red cardinal. It's just something that wasn't around me and it just didn't feel right to continue. I don't know why. It doesn't get closer to home than her own dogs. Keith has recently George. taken to painting portraits of family pets. Inspired by the time she spends with her own pups, these furry friends help her see light, colors and shapes surrounding an animal's face. They influence her work, but she has yet to paint them. I haven't painted my own dogs only because I feel that if I painted my own dog, I would be too attached to the painting and could never give it up. It would be something that I couldn't let go of. Letting go is all part of being a successful artist, which Keith has learned since taking on the role full time after leaving a stressful job working in finance. This is where she belongs. I love when I hear back from people about how happy their, their paintings make them feel and I think it, if it's something that could actually put a smile on their face, then I've done my job and it's amazing. Inspiration in her heart and picture in hand. Every portrait begins with a sketch. Small, subtle lines create the foundation used to make these creatures come alive. Yeah. 
You can find Candace's work at Art Junction in Function Junction, just outside of Whistler or at CandaceKeith.ca. Now music plays a very important role for Candace. She likes to play it loud and dance around while she's painting. And while many of us like to listen to music, others enjoy creating it. Greg Drummond wowed us with his top 20 appearance during the Peak Performance Project in 2013. And now the Port Moody native is working on a new album. All the songs have a story. Um, it's just a matter of whether they're my personal story or, or someone else's. Thank you for coffee, it keeps me alive. All through the night, yes, it keeps me alive. Greg Drummond and his band seem at home here on this rail car from 1921. And for Greg, it is home. He grew up near the Port Moody Station Museum, where we met to talk about his career and to hear a new song. A Walking Man was the debut record from a couple years back. What kind of experience uh, do you see that as looking back now? It's a little ways down the road. It was, yeah, it was something I'll, I'll never forget. Um, so much happened around that album. It was just uh, the release of it and and recording it and, and a, a studio burning down in the recording process. Um, it was almost it, it was almost never happened, but the, uh, the inevitable happened and <laughs> it came to life. You my little boy so calm, say you're doing great things. But I don't think you know where we go in between. The cover of the first record has an interesting photograph. Yeah. What's the story behind that? Yeah, it was. Um, I was in Halifax, outside of Halifax, uh, about six or seven years ago, traveling with a buddy, and we were driving through the the countryside there, and we came across this house, and I was just like, I gotta take a picture of this house. You know, this is really cool. So I ran out, and he was in the car, and then I heard some kind of clanking noise in this farmhouse next door, and it's kind of creepy. So I'm like, I'm out of here. So I took two photos, um, and then ran back in the car. And, one of them ended up being the, uh, the cover of the album. So on would we roll Till death do our hearts When your body lay still We will rise setting forth Now you know I am not alone In the rise we have come With a place in our hearts Through the hills and snow all these ties have spun and song. I'm working on writing some new songs um, for the next album, sophomore album. Um, it's going to have a different feel to it, you know. The first album is really clean and polished and, and uh, I, f I feel this is going to have a little more darker side of things, a little more live feel and uh, having the band that I built around me, uh, they'll all be part of it and uh, have more of a live kind of feel to it. first album in its entirety at gregdrummond.bandcamp.com. At the Port Moody Station Museum, I'm Paul McClellan for Go Vancouver. Well, thank you so much for joining us on this snowy episode of Go See to Sky. If you'd like to watch one of our stories or maybe a full episode again, they're all available online in HD. Just visit youtube.com slash Whistler Shaw. Go See to Sky, we're your local voice. Coming up. First is one of my transportation ever since I was five or six years old. Hitching posts, cowboys, and horses, there's nothing Hollywood about it. This trail ride is the real deal. The following are proud supporters of community programming on Shaw TV. Hairstyling and color services for Heather Butts are provided by The Loft Salon. TheLoftSalon.com 
400 athletes, 300 volunteers, three days of ski racing, Super G, Slalom and Giant Slalom, and one amazing mountain. The Whistler Cup hosts the world's best young alpine ski racers and provides them with the chance to take on the world. They arrive in Whistler with the colors and flags of their home countries and leave with friendships, pride and amazing memories. Proudly supported by Global VC and Shaw TV. Welcome back to Go See the Sky. I'm your host, Heather Botts, at the base of Whistler Village. It may look quiet right now, but get ready for it. In just a few short days, more than 400 athletes will come to Whistler in hopes of chasing their dreams. They'll be racing in the 22nd annual Whistler Cup. Athletes from more than 16 countries will be here racing for the title. It runs from Friday, April 4th to Sunday, April 6th. And there's many things that you can check out. So head to whistlercup.com for a full list of events. Our next story takes us to Pemberton. It may appear to be a scene from the man from Snowy River. Hitching posts, horses covered in snow, but believe me, this is no scene from a Hollywood movie. Pemberton's cowboy Bob Menzel is the real deal. <laughs> This is where my transportation ever since I was five or six years old. Pemberton was a wild, wild west when Bob Menzel was born. In the 1950s, the only way in and out of this farming community was by foot, train, or horse. In the early years, we could take a shotgun to school and either bring it to the office or leave it leave it out beside the tree until after school so we hunting on our way home. It was a one and a half mile walk. If you had a horse, you took it instead. There was no school buses. <laughs> hey babe, don't run off, I need you. Horses have been in the Menzel family bloodline for centuries. Cowboys, ranchers, breeders, and even guards. We have documented family history right back to the Crusades because we were the bodyguards of the kings and queens of heaven. And in 1911, Bob's grandfather and 10 children immigrated from Germany to Canada just before World War I to begin a new life in Pemberton. Freedom was what they sought and then passed on to future generations. Hey, baby. I was raised just across the field. They say you could buy land for $100 an acre, but it costs you $1,000 an acre to clear. These are only a few of the stories guests can hear on a trail ride with Bob and his partner Susan Perry, who are tacking up for a winter wonderland ride. Bob started adventures on horseback tours in 1983. The decision evolved as naturally as his environment. It was just a way to pay the horse bills instead of going logging. One day it was kind of busy and somebody said, you go for a ride and they gave me some money for it. And I thought, hey, the horses maybe can feed themselves. Bob and Susan's horses aren't your average nose to tail followers. Give any of these horses a kick and prepare for a real Wild West adventure. All of this ranch's 20 plus horses are bred from a five time Canadian English jumping champion. Every horse we have is raised from babies. Bob starts them, he's amazing at getting on anything and just making it work. He's got that gift, you know. I think the horses feed off him because he's so, so confident and so, you know, he's just there for them. Best thing known to a horse. Susan is an accomplished cowgirl herself. This is Hotshot. This is the one I won the, the World Championships and the Canadians and uh, all the rodeo titles. The two-time world champion first mounted a polo pony at three years old, but now jumping and dressage has been replaced with rodeo and barrel racing. Our horses are our stars, they're superstars. And there's nothing like a horse in this world. There is nothing. The two enjoy the freedom they find in their saddles as the cares of the world fall and settle around them like snowflakes. 
The passion that starts their day at 4.30 a.m. in the stables is shared year-round, winter, spring, summer and fall. We never really shut the trail guides. In the winter time, sort of just kind of jog around the village a little bit and then tie up with the pony or um, go in for a hot chocolate or a coffee or a latte or something. You know, it's, it's, it's a great experience. A modern cowboy hitching post wrapped in history, which is as authentic as the cowboy hat Bob Taps. I wouldn't have a life without horses. I told somebody I'd be climbing on a horse at 100 even if it was just to get on and off. We'll see if I'm not lucky. <laughs> From what used to be a historic horse trail in Pemberton, I'm Nicole Fitzgerald for Shaw TV. Bob's favorite western is The Searchers, starring John Wayne, a popular scene in old westerns, enjoying a drink by the fire after a long ride. Whiskey was often the popular choice and still is, and here in the Sea to Sky Corridor, we're lucky enough to have a local distillery, and they've recently produced Canada's first single malt organic whiskey. This organic British Columbian malted barley is about to make a big name for itself. It's being transformed into Canada's first organic single malt whiskey, a process that is both a science and an art. Hey Tyler. Hi Heather, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Oh, I'm doing well, thanks. The uh, Pemberton Distillery, I finally made it. Yeah, it's great to have you here. You ready to taste some whiskey? I am, absolutely. Good, let's get to it. Okay. It is actually quite simple. There's three ingredients, which is water, malted barley, and yeast. So this is where it all begins? Yeah, this is, this is the raw malted barley, and uh, it's, it's been grown, harvested, and then gone through the entire malting process. The malt is the starch source, what really creates the alcohol while adding rich flavor. The whole kernels are ground into flour and conveyed into the kettle, where it will cook for about four hours. Then it's pumped into the fermenter. We'll add our yeast to it, and it spends about five days fermenting, and at the end of that we'll end up with what's pretty close to a beer, essentially, and it's about an eight and a half percent alcohol beer, and then it's on to distilling. Now this looks like a real science to it. Not that the this, not that the malt isn't and the cooking isn't, but it's just these machines. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, there, there, there's a bit of art mixed in with science here, but it, yeah, for sure, this is where the, the sort of heavy chemistry comes into the process. The distillation units, or stills, heat the liquid to a point where the alcohol boils off, rising into the columns and out through a condensing tower a process this master distiller keeps a close eye on. Scottish single malts go through the distillation process twice, then you play the waiting game. It goes into the oak cask, and Canada's the same in Scotland where whiskey has to spend a minimum of three years in oak before it can be sold as an aged whiskey. I'm super happy with the way that the whiskey's turned out. It three-year-old is fairly young as far as single malts go, but it, I'm, I'm really happy with how far it's come along. The distillery has three batches from different years. All will taste slightly unique. 2010's is unpeated and smooth. The following years are more complex with a hint of smoke. It, um, it tastes fresh, it's very fresh, and you can taste the vanilla coming through. Yes, and I, I, I get some honey coming through as well. Honey. The, on, on the finish. Yeah. On the finish. It's sweet, but not too sweet. Yeah, exactly. After three long years, Shram is excited to share this unique Canadian spirit with the limited number that will be lucky enough to get a bottle from the first batch. You'll be part of a very limited few that have a bottle if you have it. Might be some bragging rights amongst your friends. <laughs> This master distiller will have the best bragging rights of all. He made it.
Well, the next batch is going to be bottled soon, so be sure to head to the distillery and get your name on the waiting list. Well, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Go See to Sky. We'd love to hear from you. Perhaps you have a story idea or just a comment about our show. Visit us at facebook.com slash go see to sky. Later in the show. Really, for me, it's all about increasing our energy without giving up the food we have to eat. Healthy and delicious and no oven needed. We're making raw brownies. The following are proud supporters of community programming on Shaw TV. Heather Butt's wardrobe is fitted by Peak Performance. Peakperformance.com 400 athletes, 300 volunteers, three days of ski racing, Super G, Slalom and Giant Slalom, and one amazing mountain. The Whistler Cup hosts the world's best young alpine ski racers and provides them with a chance to take on the world. They arrive in Whistler with the colours and flags of their home countries and leave with friendships, pride and amazing memories. Proudly supported by Global VC and Shaw TV. Welcome back to Go See the Sky. I'm your host, Heather Butts, at the base of Whistler Mountain. We're getting set for the 22nd annual Whistler Cup. In just a few short days, more than 400 athletes from 16 different countries will be here in Whistler vying for the championship. Athletes ages 12 to 15 will be racing for their countries, and there's lots happening, so be sure to check it out. If you don't want to catch the races up on the mountain, be sure to check out the Parade of Nations, which runs through Whistler Village Friday, April 4th. Just visit WhistlerCup.com for more information. Our next story takes us down to Vancouver. We're heading to the Museum of Vancouver for an interesting exhibit. Just what would Vancouver look like without man's progress? Well, our Johanna Ward looks to find out. Beavers and ravens and bears, oh my! Plus, see past your mammals of days gone by? <laughs> yeah, Stella Sika were a huge prehistoric animal. Uh, this is just a little one, about 25 feet long, but they could be even larger than that. Rewilding Vancouver is the first major exhibition in Canada using historical ecology to explore our relationship with nature. It's the history of how the natural world has changed in a place. That's a good point. I haven't seen any sea cows off the shores of the Museum of Vancouver. And this is to remind us that from the very moment that human beings arrived in this area, we were transforming the world around us. So that idea that we eat the big ones first. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> a dramatic way to tell us, yeah. yeah. Scientists who've looked at the places that humans arrive all over the world find the same thing, that humans arrive and there's usually an immediate, pretty dramatic change. Usually, uh, a, a number of the biggest animals go extinct almost right away. Just in the last couple of years, Guest curator J.B. McKinnon's latest book, The Once and Future World, inspired this exhibition. And it looks at what the natural world was like in the past and what that tells us about nature today and, and what nature could be in the future. And when I finished the book, I, I realized, well, I've run around the world learning about all of this history, but I've never applied it to the place I live. Definitely a dramatic tableau here, but not what I want to find in my bed. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that that coyotes aren't an ancient part of Vancouver. A lot of people think that they were, that they're a last fragment of the original wild here. When in actuality, the first coyotes to reach Vancouver city limits were in 1982. So we have featured our coyote with a whole bunch of artifacts <laughs> from Expo 86 to kind of represent how brand new they are to local culture. Including the world of Archie, is that one of your old That's comic right. books? That's right, yeah, there's a world of Archie <laughs> from Expo 86. <laughs> Just one of the playful elements in rewilding Vancouver. Others being the grizzly bear photo art and this beaver lodge that's bigger than today's micro apartments. We really hope that when people walk out the doors at the, at the back end of the exhibition that they will see nature in the city with different eyes and moreover that, they will, that they'll feel an urge to, to rewild the city, to bring back some of the wild qualities that have disappeared from this place. Which begs the question, how wild do you want us to get? <laughs> I would like to see Vancouver get very wild, but, but I think what's more important is that Vancouverites start to, to talk about what, what kind of natural world we want to surround ourselves with in the future. 
Well, clearly our cities have changed, and so have our cultures and our food. With the use of pesticides and additives, many people are turning to organic foods and diets like the paleo diet and the raw food diet. So this week on our DIY segment, we're testing out the raw food diet with Squamish author Adam Hart. We're making raw brownies. That's right, no oven is needed. They're healthy, and believe me, they are delicious. It's just one recipe in his latest book, The Power of Food. Everybody wants to indulge in a sweet treat, but the trick is to make it healthy, and Adam Hart, you're going to help us do that today. Yes, I am. All right, now Adam, <laughs> uh, you are the author of The Power of Food. Now that's not your basic cookbook. Uh, no, I guess it's not. Yeah, really for me it's all about increasing our energy without giving up the foods we love to eat, and The Power of Food is all about really creative, fun recipes that are easy to do, easy to use, the kids love them, families love them, so that's what it's all about. Perfect. Okay, so today we're making a raw brownie? Yeah, it's actually on page 159 of The Power of Food. Only a few ingredients we're using, so it's really easy, a lot of fun to do. Okay, let's make it. Okay, we're starting off with some dates. Dates. So, yeah, so dates really are, for me, they're, they're a real great um, energy booster, but don't spike your insulin so quick that you're going to get that massive crash. So it's really been one of those foods that I've used for many years um, in my athletic pursuits to give me instant energy. And that was just about two cups? Yeah, so I put two cups in there. Now I'm gonna throw in a little bit of cacao powder. Not cocoa. Not cocoa, this is cacao, it's a real living chocolate. Right. So lots of nutrients, lots of magnesium in there. Super high in antioxidants, so really good for, um, for any free radical damage that's going on in our cell structure. And I put a quarter cup of that in there. Now I'm throwing in half a cup of almond butter. Organic, is that the best? This is organic, okay. yeah, for sure. And it's chunky can, almond butter? I, I love to keep mine chunky. Okay. Yeah, I think it's fantastic when you have the, the almond chunks. Okay. There. And then I'm going to put in just a little bit of water. This is two tablespoons of water. Just to get it all to blend together nicely. Great. There we go. And then one last creation. Now this is your own creation. Yes. What is it? Yeah, so this is raw energy. And that's a mixture of five organic seeds. So hemp seed is the number one. And that's kind of the number one food that I've been using for about 15 years. I was pre-diabetic when I was 26 years old, and I realized pretty quick that I needed to start to be able to control my blood sugar on a daily basis, and I was a sugar addict. Um, and so instead of doing all the diets like I used to do that never really led me to having success, I started to add in some really nutrient-rich power foods. Number one is hemp seeds. Great. So as soon as I introduced hemp seed into my diet, all of a sudden uh, my blood sugar started to get under control. And I was looking for other plant-based sources of iron and calcium and uh, and good essential fatty acids. So that I got from the rest of what I put into raw energy, which is the unhulled sesame, sprouted buckwheat, chia, and flaxseed. Okay. So that's what it is, it's all five of those seeds together. All five of those seeds together makes it healthy, and we're just gonna blend our brownie here. Yeah, blend it all up, and adding the raw energy in there, or if you don't have raw energy and you just want hemp seeds on its own, which is the number one food I would highly recommend, by adding that in there, it also makes this really into a power brownie. It, you know, it is sweet and it's got a nice, nice flavor to it, but by adding that, it's, it's really decadent, but at the same time, extremely healthy. Okay. Okay, we'll turn that on. So now the idea is you want to pat it down into something that will allow it to form into your bars. Oh, okay. So I've got here just a little baking tray and a little parchment paper, so that when we do this, after we get it right inside here and pat it all down, mm -hmm. we'll be able to pull it right out. Great. Pull it out. Look at that. A firm dough. It smells delicious. Yeah, yeah. It smells amazing. So you're just using parchment paper. Yep, just using parchment paper just to make it easy to pull it out. Mm -hmm. So I just like to push it down to make sure it gets nice and firm. Essentially after that's done, you just pop it out. And now you've got your one big brownie bar, but we'll cut it up into okay. brownie pieces. But you, okay. you get the idea of of how this works. You have instant, instant brownies. healthy brownies. Here, we'll just plate that a couple will of these. energize you for the rest of your day. Yeah, and these are big, like, I'm, I mean, I know when you eat a brownie, it's usually a nice size yep. brownie. These you don't have to eat a whole lot to get, you know, to get the, the, the decadence of it and also get the nutritional power from that. Mm -hmm. But that's essentially the raw food brownie. Okay. Super easy. Thanks for showing us, Adam. Yeah, you're very welcome.
Well, those brownies were delicious. It's a recipe I suggest you try. Adam Hart's raw energy mixture is available at Save On Foods in Squamish and will soon be available at other grocery stores here in Whistler. And don't forget, April 4th to the 6th is the 22nd annual Whistler Cup, happening right here in the village and up on the mountain. That does it for this episode of Go See to Sky. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.